Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, I'm Chris Plank. I work as an enterprise architect, uh, an evangelist, a passionate advocate for platform engineering at NatWest Bank. Yeah, uh, I'm Derek. I'm a principal engineer at Sintasso. Uh, yeah, we. That's pretty much it. I'm from Brazil originally. It's from Scotland, as you can uh, manage from the accent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we're here to talk about. Uh, Platform engineering and what we're doing right now at NatWest Bank. So this isn't a polished speech. This isn't about um, right at the end what we've done. It's about what we're actually doing right now. And for those of you who don't know who NatWest Bank are, uh, we're one of the top five banks in the UK. We serve uh, 19 million customers. Um, we've got 62,000 staff worldwide. Uh, over a million new personal current accounts uh, last year. 1.5 million new savings accounts. We process one in four UK payments. We do about 750 million fun financial transactions per month. 94% um, of our customers' needs are met digitally nowadays. And we've got about 10.9 million active digital users. So, all good stuff. Yeah, and for those that are not aware, uh, we, we are Sintasso, we are the creators of Credix. It's a framework for building uh, developer platforms, for building platforms. Uh, yeah, and Credix enables you to go faster, to decrease risk in your organization, and to really manage the day two operations of uh, all of your deployments, all of your services. And I'll be running a demo uh, later now. Hopefully, everything will work. Uh, there is some stickers around uh, in the desks. Uh, there is a QR code that you can join our Slack channel. We're going to be donating uh, 10 euros per person that joins. Uh, yeah, feel free to check it out later as well. Excellent. So before I start, a quick show of hands. Um, how many people in the room have got a mainframe? Great. How many people are working on trying to get rid of those mainframes? One, two. How many people are running Kubernetes on the mainframe? One. Us. Excellent. Thanks for that. <laughs> so let me start by saying enterprise transformation is hard. It's really difficult when you're a massive organization, when you've got tens of different departments, hundreds of teams, thousands of staff. And you know, in financial services, the risks of getting it wrong are huge. You know, the fines alone are massive. And the number one thing that we've got to do is keep the show on the road whilst we're trying to transform. Um, this slide here. Oh, Derek, they've let me play with a laser. <laughs> it's deliberately uh, blurred, but this is something that we got from uh, our internal customers on their journey for uh, platform modernization, standing up provisioning, standing up tools. We spend a number of uh, months uh, on the design phase. Derek, pick a number. One in six? Five. Five months. Okay, that'll do. And then you go through a number of hoops and hurdles uh, in the next phase, the build phase. Yeah, I, like one, I want to use the laser. Yeah. Pick a number. Three. Three? Good. Three months on the build phase. And then on the deploy phase, pick a number again, Derek. Four. Four. Okay. So you, know, you can see the massive amount of time that they might spend going through all these hoops and hurdles. Each one of these is a, a step on their journey. Each of the boxes down at the bottom are all the different teams that are involved, the different handoffs, the different cognitive load that they've got to go through, the different things they've got to learn and understand on that journey. And you can see from this picture, even though it's blurred, it's massive. There's a lot of things that they need to learn about. And with that AI and other technologies coming along, containerization for new teams, there's a lot for them to learn, a lot for them to understand, and a lot for them to manage. So what's the problem? Well, over time, we try to um, resolve that by creating this library of all the different patterns and the different processes that they should go through. We gave them the promise that if they went through this process, they would get an easy path through governance, it would make their life easy, and they would get into production as quick as possible. But over time, these things have bloated, they've evolved, they've had everything thrown in there. And we now have over 135 patterns in the bank. Um, some of those are just copies for the same thing, but done in a different way by a different team uh, for very valid reasons. And so what we start to do over this process is start thinking about how we can modernize this, how we can decrease that complexity and the slowness 
that uh, has come about by everyone pushing in all their requirements, whether that's security, whether that's the governance process, whether that's the engineering practices we've got to go through, the attestation and things that we've heard about today. And how have we gone about resolving this? Well, our leadership set us four challenges. Could we use platform as a product-based uh, thinking and approach to deliver an opinionated way of provisioning services for our customers and allow them to do that in a self-service way? How could our existing platform teams and our, our business teams contribute in a democratised way? So we heard earlier on today people talking about inner sourcing. That's one of the things we want to do. How do we get them helping us build that platform in some of these new things that we want to do? How can we do this 10 times faster, four times more efficient, simplify this? And how can we ultimately move to an end-to-end -end, uh, delivery, which is in one hour, rather than those seven to 10 months that we talked about earlier? OK, so how did we do it? Well, we went wide. We came to events like this. We uh, listened to what was going on in the industry. We uh, went and talked to Gartner. We went and talked at uh, various conferences like this one. Um, we watched an awful lot of YouTube videos, <laughs> an awful lot of Abby Bangzer talking, um, an awful lot of uh, Victor uh, Farrick talking as well. And we changed our thinking and our approach. You know, we, we started thinking about, wait a minute, how do we bake everything in here? How do we make this simpler for our developers? It's not just focused on the automation, but like you've heard from other, uh, other speakers today, think about that end-to-end -end view. Think about how we simplify that, simplify the cognitive load. How can we change the provisioning so that we can provision those services back to the, you know, minutes rather than hours, days, weeks, or months? And how do we promote this uh, inner source and this democratization approach that we want to do? So we looked at all those patterns, that library, those 135 uh, patterns that, that we created, and we started to assess those in a different way. I think in the past, we tried, everyone tried to use those patterns as one way of doing something in the bank. And we quickly realized that there's really three approaches. The first part is the self-managed approach. You know, we, we've been very successful. We've got hundreds of uh, uh, applications running in the cloud at the moment and hundreds of AWS subscriptions. We've got thousands of microservices running uh, on our uh, platform as a service internally. We've got uh, thousands of applications using our IaaS platform. So we've been very successful in our cloud adoption, whether it's public or private. But how do we take that and how do we start creating these golden paths that are minimizing this uh, cognitive load? So we've got self-managed patterns that we still these business units. They've got their own engineering capabilities. They're managing it themselves. They're carrying on following those, those patterns, but how do we make them better for them? We've got the self-orchestrated, so that's the ticket ops that we heard about earlier on today. You know, people making requests and getting something provisioned for them. That's a lot of our user base, say 80% of our user base, maybe. And then there's this third one, the emerging one that we're looking at, which is the self-service-based approach where we really want those business units that don't have engineering capability just to select some pre-approved, pre-engineered, fully automated golden paths uh, from a portal, just like we've been talking about today. And if we go back to those 135 patterns that we had in the past, customization is the enemy. We don't want customization. We don't want another pattern each time we come up with a self-service model. What we want to start thinking about is options instead where they can select those options from that developer portal and be able to say, well, I don't want a Postgres database, I maybe want a Redis database with that. How do we do that? How do we support that? Without them needing to actually understand the technology that's behind that. So, we came out with our platform as a product approach. Uh, what you're seeing here is a very, very high level view of uh, what we're doing right now. So we're using Backstage, and we had someone talking about Backstage earlier on, which was great to, great to see and hear and validate everything that we are doing. We're doing an awful lot around our uh, CI and CD tooling uh, tool chain and pipeline. We're using GitLab, we're using Flux. We, we're starting small, and we're bi building bit by bit. We're adding more things in out of the CNCF landscape. And then we're creating these repos. And that's probably where a lot of the power is going to come from for us. This is what we're hoping we're going to get out of it. 
as we create these things, as we start to demonstrate it, as we build up that trust, that evidence, those working services, those uh, minimal loved products that our uh, community uh, really like and really want to use, maybe want to extend, they can start going in there and start using inner sourcing, start collaborating, start making those things better. So, with that, thanks over to you now. Good. Great. Uh, thanks, Chris. So, just a quick recap of uh, that West's objectives uh, with their platform as a product initiative. So what Chris just said, that they want self-service. They want the teams to be able to go to backstage and self-serve on the services that they have in the platform. They want it to be democratized. That means they, in a certain, they have lots of teams. Like organizations like NatWest have lots of teams, and they all have their services. Like they're responsible for different parts of the organization, and they want to provide their service. So this should be open for other teams to come and then provide their services in the platform. And they want to build those golden paths. Like all of those 135 plus patterns, they want to make that easy to follow, simple, so users can come and get like the safest and the, the right approach to request their services. And that's exactly what Cradex, I may be a little bit biased, but that's exactly what Cradex is really good for. That's why Cradex shines. Uh, so the main concept in Cradex is a promise. A promise is an encapsulation of something as a service. It's what will enable teams at NatWest to provide their services as a service, like their, their things as a service. It also integrates quite nicely with any particular API. Uh, or if it's an API-driven uh, uh, software, so it integrates with any portal like Backstage, and that's exactly what we're going to see later on. Uh, it's also an open framework. The core of Cradex is what we call the workflows, and the workflows can be written in any language using any technology. So different teams doing different things can actually contribute to the platform with the expertise they already have. Uh, and Cradex also has this concept of compound promises, which is promises that actually encapsulate other promises and orchestrate those other promises. So this allows teams to build those code and paths. So use the building blocks that is being provided by other teams and build like more compelling user experiences. Before I jump into the demo, just a quick like high level 30 seconds overview of what a, what a promise is, just so we can talk the same language. Uh, but it's basically an API. Uh, for you all that are more familiar with Kubernetes, this API is, is pretty much a CRD. Uh, it's a set of imperative pipelines, instead of steps that needs to be executed in order to fulfill the service. So this goes things like notification, billing, compliance, uh, and actually deploying the service if that's the case. Uh, and it's a set of dependencies. Dependencies are anything that needs to be installed or pre-configured in order for that service to be provided, for, to, for that promise to be fulfilled. And with that, you have everything you need to understand about the demo that I'm just about to execute. So let me try to do this. And hopefully, you can see my terminal. Yeah, it's there. Here it is. Uh, this may be a little bit tricky, because I need to look at that monitor over there. But uh, this is backstage. Uh, this is not exactly the promise that Atuat has built. But it's uh, heavily based on uh, what, what they wanted to provide and what they want to give to their customers. Um, so you can see that what they have is Backstage. Backstage is a framework for building developer portals. I'm pretty sure that you all heard about it. We heard about it uh, here uh, in this talk. And allows teams to easily consume and see what is available in the platform. So in this particular example, you can see that I have three promises already available in the platform um, providing different things as a service. So I have a bucket, a deployment, and a Postgres promise. So a user can quite easily come over here, click the Create button, choose one of the tiles, let's say deployment, uh, fill the, the form out. Let's just do that relatively quick. I set some defaults, so I don't actually need to uh, type too much. Uh, but this is kind of the form, the API, the API that the users, that the platform team at NatWest is actually providing. Uh, they use the fill those in, and then they can, can create. Um, what all of this is auto-generated by Cradex. So when you install a promise, Cradex will auto-generate those templates and those components and populate backstage on the back of it. And when the user sends the request, what Cradex will do is trigger those series of workflows. So those series of steps that are defined by the team that is building this promise to actually deploy the service. So you can see that the pipeline over there for the deployment is running, and in a, a moment or so, we should see the deployment coming up uh, on the worker cluster uh, for that particular deployment. So it's what we just saw over here. And that kind of fulfills the first criteria, the first objective of NatWest, which is to provide 
on-demand self-service uh, services. So you can, you can have deployments here. Uh, what is interesting to see is that different teams can contribute to this platform. So you can see that the deployment promise, for example, was built by the networking team. The, infra the infrastructure team built their bucket promise, and the Postgres team built the database. Uh, the database team built the Postgres promise. Um, as I said before, Cradex is a new, really open framework. Uh, an example of that is that our bucket promise over here is actually using Terraform. So if I request a new bucket, it will run Terraform commands to actually deploy the bucket on the cloud. But the Postgres promise is actually backed by this Postgres operator that is running there as my dependency. So different teams can go and contribute to the platform, uh, the services that they, like using the technology that they are more familiar with. And then they can evolve over time because the API is there to provide that interface. The third uh, thing that we chat about is, uh, the third objective is the golden path. So right now for a user to get their app running with a database, and let's say that database should be backed by an S3 bucket, they will need to manually go and create each one of those individual services and components and wire themselves together. So a platform team in NatWest could actually go around, talk to the users, and figure out what is that they need, what is like taking that platform as a product approach, uh, what would make their life easier. And then they may come up with, uh, for example, uh, app as a service uh, promise. So let me just go ahead and install this promise real quick. And what that app as a service promise will do is actually coordinate and orchestrate in that uh, all of those wiring up that needs to happen between all of those services to be able to provide not only deployments, not only uh, databases, but like the entire developer experience, the entire golden path as a service. Uh, I just installed that promise, so in a moment or two, I should see a new component appear on backstage for representing my app. Again, this is auto-generated by Cradex. And if I go ahead and click Create, the user can now see a new template. So a user of this platform can now come over here and say, well, I want to deploy a new app. Let's call it to-do app on my default namespace. Uh, here are the fields that I need to configure. So all of the complexity about requesting that uh, service got hidden for me. I can request, oh, I want a database, or I don't want a database, or I want a Postgres database. I can reveal and hit Create. So what Cradex will do on the back of this request is exactly the same as it did for the other uh, request. It will go and trigger out the pipeline. So let me go back to the terminal, and you should see the pipeline for the app running. But this pipeline is different. It's actually using those building blocks defined by those different teams uh, to provide that experience. So in a moment or two, uh, you, we should see uh, other pipelines triggering. And those pipelines are actually the pipelines defined by the, each one of the individual promise. So you can see the Postgres pipeline coming up. We can see the deployment pipeline coming up. We can see the bucket pipeline coming up uh, and running. This is going to take a little bit of time. It's downloading a lot of Terraform. Not a lot, just AWS uh, module. Uh, which in the conference Wi-Fi takes a little bit of time. Uh, but eventually, it will complete and create those buckets and wire all of those things together. Uh, and you should also see the Postgres database coming up and the, the to-do app coming up there as well on the back end. Uh, and now the user can also go back to backstage. And again, it's auto populates for those components. So you can see all of the bits that, that may make the, the to-do app uh, in, in a single page. So as Derek said, we're trying to realize some of those patterns using Kratix. We're going after the type three patterns that I talked about. Really simple use cases, just like we heard earlier on today. Start simple, start small, start iterative on that platform journey. Build up those products over time. Add more features in based on the user needs, requirements, feedback that we heard about today. Build them up into those more fully fledged offerings. Part of this is really about bringing on board thousands of new developers every year. How do we reduce their cognitive load? How do we make them productive on day one instead of, say, I don't know, day 50 of them joining the organization? They don't need to know. They need to go and talk to Bill and Eddie and John and different teams. They don't need to know they need to fill in this form and triplicate and go to this ServiceNow page that's been changed and hasn't been kept up to date. They can just go to this one portal. They can put in the information that they know and that they need and then you can start being productive. That's really what we're trying to get out of this. Yep. Uh, and that's kind of the end of the demo. Uh, so just a quick review. They can use, uh, I started with a backstage, so you can see a bunch of promises, and those promises are what provides the self-service uh, aspect. 
it's democratic, different teams are contributing to the platform, installing their own promises, defining their own processes. Uh, and yeah, the golden path can be offered by compound promises uh, via the, uh, the platform team. So I'm just going to hand over back to Chris. Yeah, so key takeaways I'd like you to take away from, t from uh, this presentation today. I probably went over it far too quickly. But the slide that showed all the steps and all the processes, that came about through uh, engaging with our customers. It actually came from one of our customers. And we went through that process. We followed it. We felt their pain. We empathized with them when we went through that process and validated it. And now we're trying to do something about that. And we heard some people talking about that earlier on this afternoon. So you can kind of relate to that. Uh, another thing, embrace different thinking and different doing. A lot of those type one and type two patterns that teams are doing at the moment are DevOps. And a lot of what we're talking about today is GitOps. Thinking about how to bake things in, thinking about how to simplify, reduce that cognitive load by platform teams baking that in, taking that need for developers to do that away from them and giving them something that they love, they use, and they enjoy. And then the third one is don't boil the ocean. You know, start small, simple things. Don't try and change everything, but just try and get something up and running that you can then demonstrate the value of the platform. You can get buy into the platform. You've got some uh, evidence there, some examples there that people can start collaborating on. They can look at the code. They can start contributing to that code. And then they can actually start adding new features and working with you. I think that's it, really. We've got time for questions. Um, so, quick question. In a bank where you have lots of siloed sources of knowledge, you've got your database team, your middleware team, how do you get them to buy into the platform? How do you get them to build those promises that other people can consume? Yeah, so we, we've... It's on now. So we've started working with our platform teams. We've, we've brought them on the journey. We've taken almost a train-the-trainer approach with our platform teams, where we've taken some of those into a feature team that our leadership has funded. And we've uh, helped them on their journey of learning, discovery. We've helped them, uh, you know, working with Syntasso, we've done a lot of pair pairing as well, uh, pair programming. Get them up to speed. And then in the next PI, they're then kind of the focal point in their home team to then expand that out into that wider team. And so we've brought in different, you know, different teams, whether that's the observability team, whether that's some of the cloud team, uh, whether it's some of the database teams. We brought them together actually working on some real promises. The beauty of the, the, the Kratix model is that you know, they're like Lego building blocks. So a promise is just like a building block, and we can put them together. And you know, some of the things that were talked about today about it's the platform team's responsibility for exposing the API. Well, that's what our platform as a product team does. But they're also kind of guiding and mentoring those um, platform teams that are developing the individual promises. And then the, the, the platform as a product team wires those together to create those APIs and those products and those patterns for people to use. So you get a lot more collaboration, a lot more deeper collaboration, because you're bringing someone into the team and working on them. But then you're getting that expansion as well through the organization because they go back to their home kind of teams and they start talking about it, they start doing it, and then other people hopefully over time will start actually contributing to that. And so we've got some objectives for this year. I mean, we're right at the, not right at the start of our journey, but you know, we're in the early stages of our adoption. And we, we had a call on Friday really wanting to talk about how we expand this out through the whole of the hosted solutions division that I work within, how we get all the platform teams on board and how we get them doing some um, promises by the end of the year, every single team, and meaningful things made available for our customers. We've been engaging with the customers as well and asking them what they want. So we're trying to bring all that together through this initiative to just make it easier for people to consume and ultimately get products out to market quicker, cheaper, better, you know, for, the, for those platform teams that actually need these hosting solutions. Sorry, last question, I promise. So that made it sound like you need to build an internal developer advocacy and developer evangelism, I guess, within the group, right? But do you need a starting point before you start evangelizing to the other teams? So in true 
corporate style. We've got lots of starting points. We've got lots of teams trying to do the same thing. And it's how you cor corral that enthusiasm together. We've got brilliant leadership who's set a lot of the direction. And we're, pro we're now in year two of a kind of year three transformation on how we want to align our whole division and um, call it Digital X. And uh, we've, we've got a brilliant team, uh, enterprise engineering, that worked with us. They're the ones that are actually uh, pushing ahead with a lot of the developer experience. They're pushing ahead with a lot of the backstage side of things, the, GitHub, get, uh, the GitLab adoption. We're pushing ahead with the Kratix stuff. Kratix and, and backstage work nicely together. So, you know, by collaboration and talking, we're, we're working on this. Um, I, I got an email and, uh, on, on Friday from a presentation Derek and I did on uh, Thursday to our infrastructure as code community. And it was from the security team actually asking, well, can we do our vault onboarding now, working with you guys using Kratix, right? So we, we had someone else in that, that uh, presentation. It's a business unit. It's our data business unit. And they said, well, we're working on some technology. We want to expose that to our users. Could we use Kratix to do that? So we're beginning to see the early kind of green shoots of people seeing Kratix, seeing what it can do, and thinking about how they could use that, how they could contribute to that. That's really how we want to, to grow this. Um, we've got a lot of different people talking at a lot of different conferences about our open source approach and what we're trying to contribute. We're members of Finos. Um, we're trying to use events like this really to, to talk, even to ourselves, about this is what we're doing internally. Come and be part of it. Hi. Over here, up the side. Um, doesn't really matter. Hey, hello. <laughs> um, really interesting talk. I'm kind of curious, um, how far do you see your platform going? Do you see it going to the point where you're actually managing things like AWS accounts or GCP projects or Azure um, accounts as yeah, well? So or? One of the first promises that we're, we're actually be, have been working on is our account vendor machine process. But we, we're looking at that to embed it. We can make it available for developers via the developer portal so that they can just go request that instead of going through the, the, the current process. And it, that will definitely make it quicker. But we're really thinking about how we bake that into some of the products. You know, and and the, the Intuit guys that were talking earlier on about the developers not having direct access to the platform, that's very much where we're trying to go for the type three patterns. We've probably got, let's, let's just say it's 80% of the business, don't have those engineering teams with those Terraform skills. You know, we've got some brilliant teams like our M-Platform team that looks after all our customer-facing websites and does phenomenal work there. But we've got teams that have maybe only one or two uh, members in that team and they want to do single-page web apps and they want simpler internal things that they want to do. They don't really need to learn about AWS. All they want to do is publish content. So we're going to build all that into a product and make that available for them to use. Because that's actually quite a popular thing that we do already on our uh, platform as a product, uh, platform as a service uh, platform at the moment. Same with microservice publishing and several other things that we put on that platform. How do we start doing those and spread those out to public cloud? That's what we're trying to do. And then we'll manage those accounts and those services they just manage kind of the, the, the consumption and the actual application part of that. Yeah. Hello. Um, that was a very nice segue to my question. Um, oftentimes, there are like people that come with one or two members, and they say, OK, I want to start with a simple web app, right? Uh, and they go with the self-service uh, approach. After a few months, they come, OK, my requirements have changed. Now I want to build uh, X or add on to this, right? Um, now you don't have that big capacity of a team where you are supporting that team for every requirement that comes into play, right? Have you come across this challenge and like have you thought about how you would scale at that point? So I think that's part of the challenge we're trying to address. You know, we in the old pattern model, we came across that. We would have a pattern and then a new application would come along from some other team and it would be a dash application name kind of um, copy of that with some subtle changes. We're now trying to address that. And you know, I had on the slide, customization is the enemy. We're trying to get away from that customization. We're really trying to minimize. We don't want 135 patterns anymore. If you think about AI coming along, it's almost like a tsunami of new unknown patterns that are going to hit us. So we're really trying to move towards more of a, um, a, a documentation at the end of the pattern. You know, Documentation is code. So that as part of building this, as part of people using it, the documentation is there. 
And if all that documentation is there and we make that a really easy path for them, then we should minimise all those different variances and we should be able to kind of steer the, the, the teams towards these things that will actually do the work for them and explain why it's better for them to do that than try and come up with some other pattern. So, I think just to maybe add to that as well on the credit side, uh, what, what, we, what we show that using the compound promise, using the building blocks, is that one team is actually consuming another team's a service via the, an API. So you can change what, a, what is happening there. So I think what the segue, the next step on the demo would be to like, what happens if there is a new mandate that every single deployment needs to have um, HA and other characteristics, like other things, uh, the networking team that owns that promise can easily apply that and get that update rolled out across the fleet. I think that's kind of uh, what, what would help with that as well, if, like requirements change. Hello. Um, nice presentation. Thank you very much for that. So a couple of questions. Uh, how do you uh, deal with some components that are very secure uh, and sensitive in terms of, of security? like DNS or firewalls or whatever, and not all the teams, so the application teams should have access to them. And what happens with the governance? I know you're a bank, you're heavy, heavily re regulated with uh, governance and the procedures on how to deploy things. How do you deal with that? Do you have approval processes or? Yeah, so a lot of that at the moment in those patterns describes those processes and those security controls that you have to go through. And we have different parts of our organization, different teams and kind of platform teams create some of those controls that everyone has to apply to say their public cloud or the private cloud stuff. We already have that, right? We're very successful in DevOps at the moment. So how do we take that and turn that into Kratik's promises? How do we maybe simplify some of those controls that we've got that were guardrails for how people do self-engineering in public cloud? We're now working on that. How do we get those kind of smaller, simpler, as part of the products, baked into the product, rather than something that's separate, maybe as a bolt-on. That's one thing that we're doing at the moment. Just to add to that as well, uh, the Cradex promise, uh, the workflow bit is that uh, a lot of those automations about compliance, billing, notifications, uh, security, scanning, all those things can be incorporated into the product. So when the user requests something as a service, it actually goes through that series of steps that are like, built by the team that is building the promise or provided by another team. Uh, one pattern that we see as well is like, you have a security team that builds a stage in the pipeline and just, what they ask is, can you incorporate this stage into your promise? Because this needs to happen for me to expose a service via, you know, on the internet, for example. So I think that's uh, how those things fit together as well. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.